Thank you for tuning in to Highland Chapel Online. My name is Nick Calloway. I'm one of the pastors here at HC. We love being able to offer this resource, but please don't let it take the place of gathering with your local church. What a privilege it is to be known, to be seen, and to enjoy the fellowship of believers. But while you're here, we hope that God's Word is encouraging to you and that you'll respond to His message. Have a great day. Good morning, church. How is everyone? My name is Luke, one of the pastors here. Uh, so grateful to be with you today. Oftentimes, uh, I'm reminded often of all that really goes in to making Sunday morning happen. Uh, this morning was one of those mornings for no in particular reason. My mind just started uh, going to all those that have a part to play in making Sunday uh, my favorite day of the week. So if you, if you are on a volunteer team on Sunday morning, I just want to say thank you. Church, can you, can you tell them thank you? Give you a round of applause. Just thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm often making changes last minute to, to scriptures and points and thoughts, and they're just always willing to step in there and do what it takes to make it happen. So thank you, volunteer team across the board. We're so grateful for you. Last week, we kicked off a sermon series called Family Gathering. And I gotta be honest with you, we've only been one week into the series and cannot speak for you, but I'm enjoying putting it together. Like, I really am having a lot of fun so far. Last week was all about peace, or the opposite of that, which is unrest. And we looked at how perhaps we're bringing uh, some unrest to those gatherings, those family gatherings, those friend gatherings, or that personal relationship with a coworker or a spouse or a friend, you name it. And we looked at how we need to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, that there is a big difference between the two. So I pray last week was an encouragement to you. It taught you something. It convicted you. Uh, it, it nudged you along in your pursuit to make peace, not just keep the peace. Today, Pastor, what are we going to talk about? Well, today we're going to talk about marriage. Are you pumped? All the married people are like, come on, man, bring it. We're going to talk about marriage today. All the men got real nervous, like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. We're going to talk about marriage today. And what kind of marriage are you bringing to the table? We're all bringing our marriage to the table, but there's two categories of that marriage that you're bringing to the table. You're either bringing a healthy marriage to the family gathering, or you're bringing an unhealthy marriage to the family gathering. I spoke with the pastor team this past week about this concept, and we were all in unison when we agreed that there's really just two categories when it comes to marriage. That there's really no middle ground. You see, your marriage is either healthy, right? It's full of love, sacrifice, like you, you're pursuing health, you, you know that it's always gonna be a work in progress and you're, and you're making strides forward, or you're in an unhealthy marriage. You're in that environment that is just simply not healthy. There's only two categories. Which one are you in today? Which one are you bringing to the family gathering. What I know about any type of gathering is that given enough time, that gathering will expose what kind of marriage you really have. It will expose whether that is a healthy marriage or that is an unhealthy marriage. And I need to say this today. Your pastors want what's best for your marriage. God Almighty wants what's best for your marriage. Do you believe that this morning, church? Do you believe it? So, I got to share this story with you. Based on that concept, that given enough time, those gatherings will expose you. It'll expose your marriage. Several, several years ago, I was at a staff Christmas party, not Holland Chapel, okay? Not Hall in Chapel, several years ago, at a staff Christmas party. And there was a couple at that Christmas party that I would categorize as having an unhealthy marriage. 
And simply their presence there together in the gathering, as what the uh, students would say, I'm going to sound old, it was pretty cringe. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been, I'm not making light of marriage, but this particular one I got to laugh about or I'll cry. You, you ever been around one of those marriages? Don't raise your hand. You, you ever been to a family gathering? You ever been to a friend's giving? You ever been in that scenario where their presence amongst the group just makes you feel, ah, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, boy, that's just going to be a rough ride home. You know what I'm talking about? We've all been there. We've all seen it. We've all been around it. And this was one of those marriages. This marriage was so bad. This staff Christmas party was ruined. Like the fun, the joy in the room was just deflated by their relationship. You know, do you know what I'm talking about? Like it was rough. It, but th this marriage was, was so unhealthy that this environment exposed so much that I had to go to that individual and say, what's going on? You see, it exposed the marriage that they had. Sadly, the marriage was so unhealthy, so far gone, that one of my team members three months later ended up separating from his wife, ended in divorce. You see, those gatherings, given enough time, church, will expose you and what really is underneath the service. And if your marriage is a healthy one or an unhealthy one, I've got to say it. I've said it to you before, and I'll say it again, and I'll keep on saying it. So I need, you, I need you to really tune in right now. If you're a married person in here today, Satan hates your marriage. Did you hear that? Satan hates marriages. I really need you to internalize that. That, that we all married couples right now, we're on the same plane. We are despised by the same one. Like Satan hates your marriage. And, and he wants to come after your marriage. He, he cannot stand when two people are joined in unison. He cannot stand marriage. Why, pastor? Why does Satan hate my marriage so much? Satan hates your marriage because of what it represents. Are you with me so far, child of God? Satan hates your marriage because of the picture that it presents. What, what is marriage? What does marriage represent? What is the purpose of marriage? Like, what is the picture of marriage? i got to be real with you. And, and I need you to jump into this conversation with me. When I was 23, 24 years old, engaged, about to be married... I did not know what I was doing. Not in regards to Ashley, because I most definitely wanted to marry her. You with me, guys? Like, you, you knew that you wanted to marry your wife. Like, you, you, you knew, man, this is the time. I'm in love. I want to get married. But, but in the context of marriage, a biblical marriage, I had no idea what it represented. Anybody relate to that? How many of the married couples in here went through, and I want you to own it, I want you to raise your hand, how many of the married couples in here went through some sort of premarital counseling? Did you go through premarital counseling? Yes. How much of it do you remember? Don't answer. Man, you learned about finances, right? You're going to fight about money. You, you learned about in-laws. Boy, you're going to fight when it comes to families, you know? Uh, you know, uh, all, all about how to handle uh, intimacy and sex. All the guys tuned in for that one, didn't you? But more than those things, we should have been taught what the marriage relationship represents. The marriage relationship represents Christ and his bride, the church. That's the picture. That's what marriage represents. And I want to know, can anybody relate? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to shout it. When I took her hand in marriage on the stage in front of family, friends, and God Almighty, I did not know that full picture. I, I could probably at the time preach a message on it. I was in ministry at the time. I, I knew all the scripture about what marriage is, but until that scripture met context of real life, I had no concept of that biblical picture. I just didn't understand. And so many people step into that marriage relationship 
with no knowledge of the scripture or, or no knowledge of the picture. And here's the problem. They never seek to learn it. So they have no idea what their marriage represents. And if you have no idea what your marriage represents, what are you working towards? What are you trying to pursue? What are you trying to imitate? Marriage is a picture between Christ and his church. I want you to write that down. It'll be on the screen. Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read Ephesians chapter 5, 23 through 25. It says, For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. We've heard that before, haven't we? I hope you have. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And how did he do that? Men, he gave up his life for her. The marriage relationship that you enter on this side of eternity is to represent that side of eternity. Your marriage represents Christ and his bride, the church. Now, pastor, man, are you not going to go through that like uh, archaic definition uh, of marriage, that the marriage is between one man and one woman for all eternity, and they exist to procreate and make babies and all that stuff? That's all true. But when we look at the New Testament context of marriage, it elevates all the Old Testament definition. When we look at the New Testament and what Jesus said about marriage, boy, that's a tall order. But it should encourage you. It should give you some knowledge that as a married person, this is what I should represent. This is what we should be working towards. This is what my marriage should look like. Does your marriage look like that? Remember, you have two categories. You're either in a healthy marriage or you're in an unhealthy marriage. A healthy marriage is going to exhibit... It's going to display a beautiful picture of Christ and his bride, full of love, sacrifice, joy, honor, respect, on and on and on. An unhealthy marriage will distort the picture of Christ and his bride. Did you hear that? Now, I need to say this caveat. There is no perfect marriage. Everybody take a deep breath. There is no perfect marriage, but there are marriages that are healthy and there are marriages that are unhealthy. Which one, which one are you in? Like which category do you fall into? God loves your marriage, church, and God wants your marriage to make it. But far more than just your marriage make it, he, he wants your marriage to thrive. He, he wants your marriage to be successful. He wants your marriage to be a good and complete and honoring picture of Christ and his church. That's what he wants. So I need to say a few things before we get into the real practical side of today's message. If you're an unmarried person, don't tune out. You may become married one day. If you've been married a long time and think you got this thing all figured out, trust me, from personal experience, it doesn't matter how long you've been married. Satan hates your marriages. And a surprise could be a right around the corner for any one of you. Length of time that you've been married does not represent a healthy marriage. Did you hear that? Please. It could simply mean that you've been in an unhealthy scenario for a really long time. I need you to tune in. Nobody is exempt from today's message. God loves your marriage. And I believe that the Bible has lots to say about marriages. Do you believe that, church? That God is really for you. He's for your marriage. He wants to help your marriage. But if you are in the category today, when I said there is healthy marriages and there are unhealthy marriages, I do not have to explain. I, I do not have to give you something to reveal which side that you're on. You walked in here this morning knowing good and well which one of those you are. You know. 
if you have a healthy marriage or an unhealthy marriage. So if you're in the category today of unhealthy marriage, I really need you to tune in because God has a lot to say to you. So I want to pose this on the screen. It'll be in a question form. How can we help our unhealthy marriage? Why did I put we with emphasis? In an unhealthy marriage, if only one person is pursuing last week's message, peace, restoration, healthy marriage, it'll never work. You see, it's going to take both parties to pursue a healthy marriage. How can we, as a couple, pursue a healthy marriage? So really, in the question, that's point number one. It's going to take both of you. It's going to take both sides pursuing a healthy marriage. So what I've done this week is I've, I've reached out to a biblical counselor friend, okay? So as I was putting this message together, I wanted to hear other voices. I wanted to see how other people who are much smarter than I approach this topic. So I reached out to a biblical, certified biblical counselor who deals a lot in marriages, and I said, I need your help. What do you do? How do you take an unhealthy marriage through this process? Like, what are some things, what are some steps that you take? And his response was this. Every marriage has its own set of issues that require really specific needs, and I get that. But he says there are some basic things that apply to all marriages. So that's what we've done today, taking a little bit of of his wisdom paired with the Word of God, and I'm presenting it to you in effort, in hope, to give you some steps, to give you some tools in your tool belt if you are dealing with an unhealthy marriage to hopefully move in the right direction. Is that what you want? You don't have to say anything, but I know that's what you want. So how can we help our unhealthy marriage? The the first thing that I want you to write down, and this goes for everyone, okay? So don't feel like if if your neighbor sees you writing notes, like, "Oh, oh, oh, they're in trouble. Not at all. This is for everyone. I want you to write this down. Pursue the Lord above all else. Specifically, if you are in an unhealthy marriage, this needs to be at the very top of the list. Pursue the Lord above all else. I've never seen a healthy marriage where only one person is madly in love with the Lord. Never seen it. I've definitely never seen a healthy marriage where both are out of love with the Lord. You see, this is fundamental in all aspects of your life, all aspects, especially your marriage. Are you pursuing the Lord above all else if your current context is unhealthy, if your current context of your marriage is is broken, like it's in danger and you know it? You, You need to ask yourself, is the Lord at the center of my heart? Like, am I pursuing Him with all that I have? Like, he, is He really everything to me? Because here's what I know about the circumstances that we face in life. Enter whatever circumstance, not just marriage. When we deal with things, more times than not, we like to put distance between us and the Lord. That's our flesh. So if you're in an unhealthy marriage, chances are you're going to be tempted by the evil one to distance yourself from God Almighty. That's the opposite of what we should do. You need to pursue the Lord above all else. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to His name. Do you have allegiance to his name? Are you madly in love with him? Are you pursuing him with all you have? When I took Ashley's hand on stage in front of everyone and God himself, I made a commitment, a covenant, a promise to her to always love God before her, to love him most. You see, if you love God the most, then it's really easy to love your spouse the best. Like it's just easy for you to love them if you are in pursuit of God Almighty. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 
9 and 10. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal, what is our goal? To please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. In this context, our goal is to please him with our lives. So I need you to examine your life right now, husband, wife. And I need you to ask yourself this question. Individually, individually, am I living my life right now to please God? Am I living every single day to please him and only him? If we get step number one right, everything else should fall into place. Pursue God, pursue Christ above all else. Ask yourself the question, am I pursuing him with all that I have? The next thing that I want you to write down is there are no room, there is no room for egos in a marriage. No room for egos. This particular Christian counselor wrote this. He says, I believe the biggest issue, are you hearing me out? This is, this is a man who deals with broken marriages all the time. I need you to listen. I believe the biggest issue in every marriage is my love of me. The love of me. Me, 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 me. It's a very self-centered mentality that causes a lot of issues. There is no room for egos in a marriage. None. Zero. When Scripture says the two become one, there's a lot involved in that particular passage. But with that, yourself, it, it dies in that moment of marriage. And it no longer becomes Luke and Ashley. It becomes us as a marriage. It's no longer everything that Ashley wants and everything that Luke wants. It's what's best for the marriage. Like when you are married, when you're joined in marriage, it's no longer about your ego. It's no longer about your pride. It's no longer about your desire. It's all about the marriage. Have you learned that one? That one takes some time, doesn't it? There are no room for egos, but specifically in an unhealthy marriage environment, A strong ego will drive that sucker into the ground faster than anything. You need to check your pride. Check your pride at the door. It's not about you. It's about you too as a marriage. Marriage is the death of me and the birth of we. There are no room for egos. Proverbs 11, verse 2. Pride leads to disgrace. There are a lot of marriages that are disgraced because of pride in the home. But with humility comes wisdom. Are you checking your pride at the door? Is the result or or the cause of a lot of arguments the result of your pride, the result of your ego? It's time to check the attitude, husband, wife. It's time to let the ego go and pursue the marriage, not the love of me. I learned this a long time ago. A pastor taught this in seminary, and I need you to, I really need you to write this down, and I will encourage you to chase it down with every fiber of your being, and you'll see that it's true. At the root of every sin is pride. I want you to write that down. At the root of every sin is pride. If your marriage is on the rocks, is it because of your pride and your ego? You need to check the ego. The third thing that I want you to write down this morning, really important one, is that you need to get out of your emotions and into your thinking. Get out of those emotions and into biblical wisdom into thinking wisely. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, writes this about our feelings. He says, feelings are more fickle than the wind and more unsubstantial than a bubble. Did you catch that? All the deer hunters know about that fickle wind, don't we? Like it'll switch on a dime. Your feelings will let you down. 
The scripture is so clear that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Your feelings are going to lead you astray. My feelings, I'll just make it personal. My feelings oftentimes take me to places I don't need to go. Can you relate to that? Like in that marriage environment, when things are just not going well, we're so tempted to react based on our emotion. Have you ever reacted based on your emotion? Can we just all raise our hand just so we can see all married couples are in this boat together? Absolutely. And is it oftentimes an overreaction? Absolutely. I see this play out in my own relationship all the time. You ever been a little agitated with your spouse? Like, is it okay for for your pastor from the stage to say, my wife and I, we, we get in, I'll just say some tiffs every now and again? Is that like a Christian way to say, we don't always agree? right? But I love her more than life itself. Like we get into these little arguments and if, and if we're, if we're not careful church, like those emotions take over. Oh, you just made me mad. So I react out of anger and that never works out. But, but if we've made each other upset, we're in that tiff and we take a break. Like we step away from the situation. We calm down, we get out of the emotion and into our thinking, we realize that we just acted like some seventh graders. Like we'll just realize that what we were arguing about was escalated for no good reason. We were acting immature and we were acting out of emotion. But here's the real danger. If you're in an unhealthy marriage, chances are more than just little tiffs every now and again, that's a daily occurrence for you. And you are living and you are reacting purely out of emotion and not your thinking. What does scripture has to say about that? Proverbs 23, verse 19. The word of God says, hear my son and be wise and direct your heart in the way. You see, the heart is deceitful. If we always react on emotion, those reactions will never be right. What the Word of God here is saying is fill your mind with the wisdom from above. Open your Bibles every now and again. Read the Word of God. Allow truth, not emotion, to guide your life. Like, fill your mind with the wisdom from above. Uh, Romans 12, like, be transformed, the renewing of your mind. Uh, Allow wisdom to control your thoughts and then take captive those emotions. And then you'll realize, I got angry for no good reason. And that was foolish. My bad. Learn to say sorry, too. That's not in there. Point 76. Like, this message could be forever long, okay? There's so much that the Word of God has to say. But don't act on emotions. Emotions will take you to places you never need to go. Let your mind be driven by truth that's found in God's word. The fourth thing that I want you to write down, so important, don't wait, get help. And I think out to the side, yeah, I wrote counseling in parentheses. Don't wait, get help. Specifically there, biblical counseling. Can we talk about that for a moment? I was raised in church, and I don't know that I ever heard a pastor say, pursue therapy, pursue counseling, pursue anything like that. I never did, but I'm telling you now. Don't wait. If your marriage is unhealthy, if it's broken, Don't wait. Pursue help. Ask. Get the help that your marriage needs. People automatically assume they'll be good at marriage. They just think we will. Like, I'm going to get married and this is going to be awesome. I'm going to dominate. It's going to be great. I've got it all figured out. No, we don't. No, we don't. 
And we seriously need some help. Before I say any more about this, let's go to the Word of God. Proverbs 15, verse 22. Plans go wrong. You had a plan for your marriage, didn't you? And if it's unhealthy, that plan has gone wrong. Maybe because there was a lack of advice, as Scripture says. Many advisors bring success. The Word of God tells you to seek help. Proverbs 19, verse 20. Really need you to tune into this one. Get all the advice and instruction you can. Get all the wisdom. Get all the instruction. Get all the advice. Get all the help that you possibly can so you will be wise the rest of your life. Pursue the help that you need. But we need to talk about something, and I need you, I need you to look at me because I'm not even going to pretend that 100% of the marriages that walked in here today are in the healthy category. I need you to look at me. If your marriage is unhealthy, I really need you to pursue the help that you need. I asked this particular Bible counselor, I said, I want to be able to share this with the church. I need you to tell me, at the course of your professional environment, all those marriages that you've counseled, what is the number one excuse that you hear as to why they waited so long to get the help? And he said, point number two, pride. I think I can fix it. I think we can fix it. I think I can do this on my own. I think I've got enough grit and want to to figure this thing out. No, you don't. You need help. Get the help that you need. And the point says don't wait. Why do I say that? Because counseling is so taboo, especially in a Christian, especially in a Baptist concept, context. It's so taboo that we treat counseling as the step that we take right before divorce, don't we? Whew, divorce is coming. I know it. Like it's right around the corner, so we better go to counseling. You've already given up. If that's your mindset, you're already done. Go to the courthouse. Stop treating it as a last resort. Stop treating counseling as triage and treat counseling as preventative medicine. You with me? So stop treating it like so taboo. Like, man, if anybody finds out, that means we're done. Like people are going to, boy, they're just going to, poor couple, going through biblical counseling. And if that's you, if that's how you treat those folks, shame on you. Like we need help. Marriages need help. Never be ashamed of seeking help. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until it's that last step before divorce. Allow counseling to be a part of the restoration journey, please. So do away with that foolish taboo of biblical counseling. Seek the help that you need. Recognize today that you need it and pursue it. Don't wait until it's too late. Please do not wait. Get help. Get help. God loves your marriage. Your pastors love your marriage. And we desperately want what's best for your marriage. Does the church understand that? Can you give me something? Like we are so for you. God is so for you. He wants what's best for you. He loves marriage. So today's closing is going to look a little different an effort to help you, help you take those steps that are necessary to step into that space of an unhealthy marriage. This afternoon, everybody that's signed up, if you've ever given us your phone number, you're going to receive a text message from your church, Holland Chapel Hall. And in that text message, you'll see a link for a survey. And in that survey, I think it's going to be on the screen, go ahead and show that for me, there's going to be some questions on the survey. It's going to look a lot like that. And in the survey, you're going to be prompted with some of these choices. The first one is, we would like to receive resources on marriage. 
Now, Pastor, you could just put some books in the back corner, let us go get them. I could. But maybe the resource that I provide back there is not going to directly handle your issue. So you can reach out to us, we can speak with you and see exactly what you're dealing with and point you in the direction of the resource that will most likely help you the greatest. The second thing is we need marriage counseling. A big hurdle for a lot of couples that may finally come to the point and realize we need some help is you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. What, what do we do? Like, how do I even begin to do that? I've never gone to counseling. I have no idea what's it going to cost, all that good stuff. We can help you with that. So if you finally come to the point where you're willing to step into a counseling environment, please check that box. We'd be happy to help you. The, the next thing is we'd like to join a six-week class on marriage. We're going to be offering one of those very soon here at Holland Chapel. We're offering one right now. They're meeting right now, but we're going to offer it again for you if you would like that. And here's the fourth one, because you may be out there going, man, we, we're doing great, honey. Love you. I've been married to you for a long time. Uh, you're precious, and we really want to help some of these marriages that are struggling. So this last one is we'd be willing to help others with their marriage. We see that in Scripture, specifically in Titus, like we're supposed to help other people. We're supposed to help them. We're supposed to come alongside of them and help them. So if you're a couple in here, your marriage has just been blessed by God Almighty, I want to say, Praise God. Praise God. But don't waste the resource of time. Don't waste the resource of wisdom. Don't waste that resource. Make it available to your church where we can put you on a list and say, we, we know of a couple and we would love to pair them with you. You can just help them. Walk through life with them. Help them figure some of this stuff out. What a blessing you would be. So we'd really love for you to check that box if you want to step into that space and help other couples that are struggling. Because so many people walk in here under this misconception that if you're at church every Sunday, everything is going great. It's not the case. There are many couples that need lots of help, and you could be a blessing in their journey. So you're going to get that text message this afternoon at, at some point. And then if you don't get the text, you'll uh, get an email this week that will also have the, the link in there. So you'll get that opportunity to fill that survey out. And I really want you to take advantage of it, church. You with me? We're all bringing something to the table. You're either bringing a healthy marriage or you're bringing an unhealthy marriage. If you're bringing an unhealthy marriage, let's get you some help. It's all right. God loves you. He loves your marriage. I want to enter into a time right now where I pray. And oftentimes, if I'm just being real because I've set where you are, when the guy on the stage prays, it's a time for me to collect the things that I got. For the ladies, just jingling the purses, right? The dudes, like, I got to shut the Bible, find my phone, get my keys. We got to get, right? That guy's praying. It's my opportunity to make haste so I can be the first out the door. Are you convicted? <laughs> like, man, we all thinking it, but he said it out loud. Golly. Some of you ladies dropped your purse right now. You're like, Boop, nope, nope, not today. Did you drop your purse? Here's what I want to do. I want to have a special moment of prayer where I'm not just praying to you and the Lord, but you're joining with me. Are you with me? Would you help me today as I pray? Pray with me for the marriages that are broken and hurting and unhealthy. Maybe right now you've got a marriage on your mind. When I talked about that broken marriage just making you feel all cringe, you know exactly who that is in your life. So I want to ask you, have you prayed for them? Have you prayed for their marriage? I'm going to ask you to today as I'm praying to pray for that marriage. Intercede on their behalf to God the Father. Or maybe today, you're the unhealthy marriage. And maybe you've never prayed for your own. Pray for your marriage. Join me in praying as we close. God, we love you. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for the instruction of your word. Thank you. We praise you for days like today. 
where we can look at your word and we can talk about marriage. Our world hates marriage. Satan is trying to destroy them as we speak. So we have to talk about it. And I'm so thankful that your word talks about it. And God, I want to start by just saying we we praise you for the marriages that are healthy. And I pray that you keep them that way. Thank you, God. And God, we lift up the unhealthy marriage. The one that if we are just being totally honest with you, God, is on the brink of disaster. The one that's in real trouble. We pray for those marriages. That they would pursue you with all they have. That both parties would check their egos. That they wouldn't be driven by emotion. And they would come to the point where they would seek help. Help them, God. Help every single one of them. Because marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. Help us to display that fully. Help us, God. Thank you for Jesus. We ask everything in his precious and holy name. Amen.